Welcome to the New York Historical Society. I'm Louise Mirer, New York Historical's president and CEO. We are thrilled to welcome David M. Rubenstein back to the New York Historical Society as moderator of this evening's program. Mr. Rubenstein is the co-founder of the Carlyle Group, one of the world's largest private equity firms. Along with his illustrious professional career, he's been an extraordinary patriotic philanthropist, as well as collector and generous lender. We are also delighted to welcome Drew Gilpin Faust back to the New York Historical Society this evening. She is the 28th president of Harvard University and the Lincoln Professor of History in Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences. She's the author of six books, including This Republic of Suffering, Death and the American Civil War, for which she won the Bancroft Prize, as well as our own Barbara and David Zelaznik Book Prize in American History. Drew, thank you very much for coming this evening. It's a pleasure. Uh, I thought what we would do is divide the evening into two different parts, both of which begin with an H, history, and Harvard. So why don't we talk about history, your life as a historian, and particularly this book, This Republic of Suffering. Well, first, uh, you grew up in Virginia. And were you always interested in being a historian, or how did you come into being a historian? In some ways, it was inescapable, because I lived right in the middle of so many Civil War events. I lived on the Lee Jackson Highway. I lived in the community where um, guerrillas, Mosby and others, had raced back and forth through Ashby's Gap uh, and down the Shenandoah Valley. And on weekends, the family activity was often to go visit a battlefield in the area. And I also grew up in the years just leading up to the uh, 100th anniversary of the Civil War. And so there were lots of reenactments and reenactment of John Brown's raid in, in Charlestown, not far, from, not far from where I was growing up. So I was surrounded by history. Now, your ancestors had fought in the Civil War or not? Yes, they had on um, both sides of the family, sides. but different different sides of the okay. war. Okay, but you're growing up in Virginia and you're visiting Civil War sites. Did your family say, well, actually, we could have won this war in the South if we had done this, or they didn't, they didn't take the sides at that point? Well, the person who was probably most actively engaged in these questions was my older brother. And so we played Civil War all the time in the woods around the house. And I had a little rifle. I had a BB gun. It's a good thing we didn't shoot each other. But my problem being younger was that I always had to be Grant. And it was, <laughs> it was a long time before my brother told me that I'd actually won. I don't think he ever told me. I think I figured it out somehow. So uh, you went off to Bryn Mawr. Though your family had often sent its mails to Princeton. How come you didn't go to Princeton? I'm too old to have gone to Princeton. They didn't take women. In they didn't take day. women. OK. So you went to Bryn Mawr. I did. And did you major in history? I did. And then you went to get your PhD at the University of Pennsylvania? Well, I worked for a couple of years first. I worked for the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And then I decided I couldn't stand not being in the academy. And I went back and got a PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. And you specialize in history. And, and mm -hmm. you specialize in the antebellum South and Civil War area. Mm -hmm. That was my interest. OK, so just on a couple overarching questions before we get into this book. Um, is you, do you think, in hindsight, that the people who lived in the Confederacy ever believed that Lincoln was going to, uh, in effect, fight a war of that magnitude? Or did they think they could secede and that would be the end of it? I don't think people on either side, north or south, thought that a war would occur after secession. And they certainly didn't think that a war of the magnitude that unfolded would occur. There, the quotes from, for example, James Chestnut in the South saying he would drink all the blood that was shed, would be shed in the war, expecting there to be none. No blood. And people in the North felt that um, the South would quickly be brought to heel. You, you'll remember stories about um, Bull Run, First Manassas, and how people took picnic baskets out from Washington because they thought the Confederates would be routed and it would be a simple afternoon and that would be the end of it. And that of course, was the something. First Battle of the First War, and people came war. out just to, like a spectator yep. sport, and they didn't realize people were going to be mm -hmm. killed, and they thought yep. the South would win. That'd be the end of the war. Mm -hmm. Well, in hindsight, um, now with all this history behind us, uh, do you think there's anything the South could have done to actually win the war? I do. I think we now assume that the war was going to go the way it did um, because of the enormous 
superiority in numbers and productivity in the North. But Lee's plan, Lee's hope, was to be able to undermine the morale of the North and have the North give up. So if we had had a different president, somebody who had been willing to compromise, if McClellan had won the election of 1864, there might well have been um, a compromise that would have allowed the South to leave. And Lee was assuming this or counting on this, and that's why he was willing to take such enormous losses, because he thought if he could just have a dramatic enough victory to dispirit the North, then um, the North would give up. One of the ways that he was trying to do that, I believe, was to go into northern territory and uh, kind of surprise the North, mm -hmm. and that's what he really mm -hmm. tried to do at Gettysburg. Had uh, the South won at Gettysburg, or the Confederacy won, do you think that would have ended the war? It might well have. It, it would have depended, of course, on whether Lincoln was able to press forward in spite of the kind of demoralization that that would have brought about. But both with the feint up northwards to Antietam in the fall of 1862, and then again the following summer with Gettysburg, Lee was trying to make a point and bring the war home to the north in a way that would undermine the commitment to the conflict. So you're a historian and not a predictor, but let's suppose the South had actually won the war. Where would the country be today? Do you think we'd be two different countries, or do you think we would have come back together again? In, during the 1960s, there were a lot of speculations and a little book by the, David Donald put together, a professor at Harvard, about what would have happened if the South had won. And so there's been a lot of ruminations about whether we would have just balkanized all of the Americas. Would then there have been other secessions? Would the West have been a separate country and New England a separate country? How long would slavery have lasted? Um, I'm not a predictor, as you say, but it, I don't think that there would necessarily have been a reunion and the nation we have today. I think the war was necessary to preserve the union as we have known it. On slavery, um, some people say the war was fought for slavery. Some people say it was fought to keep the country together. In your view, in hindsight, was the war really fought over slavery, and is that what secession was all about? Yes. I think there's no question about it. And one of the most powerful pieces of evidence is the um, actions taken by different state conventions who had voted in favor of secession, sending representatives to other states to urge them to also secede, and their arguments were all about defending slavery. If you look at the language explaining secession in the southern states and the kinds of persuading they tried to do to bring other states into the Confederacy, it is the notion of slavery, to quote from Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy, slavery was the cornerstone of the South that needed to be preserved. So do you fault the founding fathers when they drafted the Constitution for not eliminating slavery, or would we not have had a union or a Constitution had they tried to do that? It's an interesting question to say how, um, how much more wiggle room they might have had than, than they exercised. There were a lot of compromises, as you know well, three-fifths clause, et cetera, to try to bring all these states together and yet um, adjust to their very different uh, attitude, the very different attitudes of whites, north and south um, towards the slave institution. There was an article that I always assigned to students back when I was teaching Southern history. Um, many years ago before I took on these other um, adventures. And it was written by a man named William Freeling. He was a longtime professor at uh, Johns Hopkins University. And what he did in this article is he went through all the compromises in the Constitution, but pointed out how ultimately they were going to put slavery on a path towards extinction. And they were going to require that this issue be resolved. And so his defense of the Founding Fathers was they did as much as they could at the time and they also set up a situation in which slavery ultimately would have to be confronted and shut down. It's an interesting argument. Now, when Abraham Lincoln was running for president in 1860, he didn't say, let's abolish slavery. He actually said he would support the then proposed 13th Amendment, which actually uh, said that slavery would remain part of the Constitution. Um, why did he change his views on slavery? One of the really wonderful aspects of Abraham Lincoln is how he learned. And when you look at Lincoln's experience during the war, you see him learning from experience, both as um, he 
understands military matters better and ultimately finds the general that can win the war, but also how he sees slavery differently and how he sees his opportunities to act against slavery differently. He did not think that slavery could survive ultimately, or the nation could survive half slave and half free, as he said. But he also knew at the beginning of the war, or before the war when he was elected, that he did not have the foundation on which to attack it. And so his position had been it shouldn't expand any further, but he wouldn't interfere with it where it already existed. When the war broke out and he saw, saw that he could define slavery as an instrument of strength and war power for the South, in other words, having slavery enabled the South to mobilize more white men for the military, he could then define slavery as something that had to be defeated in order to enable military victory. And that gave him a new angle that he was able to use that wasn't available to him before the war. Now, he only had a second grade education, more or less, uh, though he read a lot. Um, but he was a great writer, the Gettysburg Address, the Second Inaugural Address. Do you think if he had gone to Harvard and had a Harvard degree, <laughs> he could have been a better writer? We probably would have ruined him. Really? Okay. <laughs> so, um, Let's talk about the Civil War uh, death and the, what you've talked about in The Republic of Suffering. It's a very interesting book that describes in gruesome detail how people died in a massive way that never the world had never seen before. So at the time of the Civil War, there were roughly 22 or 3 million Americans, something like that, and four and a half, or 4 million slaves, roughly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how many people died during the Civil War? You had roughly what percentage of the population died? Well, when I wrote this book, which was published in 2008, the generally agreed upon figure about the number of deaths was 620,000. And just a footnote, we don't know. We do not have accurate counts um, because there was not adequate record keeping. But the generally accepted number was 620,000. In the years pretty soon after I published this book, a lot of modern demographic techniques were used to reanalyze some of the elements of Civil War data. And now the estimate is more like 750,000. So that is the number that I think is, is most widely used now for the, the extent of Civil War death. About 2.5% of the population today, over 7 million dead. In other and words, that's today, what, if we had 2.5% of our population killed in a war today, that would be about 7 million people, right? So that's, you know, when 9-11, as terrible as it was, it killed, I think, in, in the two towers, roughly 3,000 people. Um, in all of our wars put together, not counting the Civil War, we haven't lost as many people as we lost in the Civil War. Is that right? That's correct. So in the Civil War, uh, who lost more, the North or the South, in terms of uh, people killed? The North um, lost more. in real terms, but in terms of percentage of the population, the Southern um, death toll was much more um, dramatic. And the reason so many people died, it's not only because the war went on for such a long period of time, but it's because military armaments were so much better than they had been in the Revolutionary War. Is that part of the reason? There were a number of reasons. One was simply the scale of the war. The mobilization through the draft and volunteering of mass armies. The armies were bigger than they had been in any previous war. So the scale of participation and the scale of loss were in some ways um, consonant with one another. Another element was that um, death, when you get, I mean, excuse me, disease, when you get that many people out of different parts of the country, you bring them together. First they get the measles and people die of that then they don't have an understanding of germ theory. So they pollute their own camps. They die of typhoid. There is not um, antiseptic surgery, so people die uh, from surgical intervention. So that was another element of it. But there's also a change in the technology of war with increased firepower, so that soldiers were exposed for longer uh, to more firepower than had previously been the case. And that, of course, increased the death rate as well. So in the Revolutionary War, I think we lost total of militia and other uh, civilians and everything, about 30,000 people, something like that, I think. Um, we lost here about 750,000, but uh, the people we that were killed, uh, that 95% in your book, I think, were killed because of rifle shooting, and maybe just 5% because of other kinds of armaments, and a very small percentage uh, were killed because of um, uh, other things. But then 
disease killed about 25% of the people who were totally killed, I think you said in your book. It was more, actually. More, more died of disease than died of battlefield deaths. Okay. And the 95% would be of those who died of okay. battle injuries. So um, let's talk about what happens when people were uh, killed. Historically, in the Civil War, uh, we didn't really have a system, you point out in your book, for um, dealing with people who died. Because in the Revolutionary War, very few pe people, relatively speaking, died. Uh, I guess they were taken back to their homes when they died. But here we had a different problem. Massive numbers of people are being killed, and the wars are still going on, the, the battles are still going on. So what happened to the dead? They just stayed there, or what, what did people do? What I was so astonished to find when I started doing research on this book was the absolute absence of any kind of systematic procedure for dealing with the dead. And that is consistent with the lack of anticipation of the scale of the war. The idea that, you know, I drink, as Senator Chestnut said from South Carolina, I drink all the blood that was, was shed. So when these deaths happened, first of all, people were away from home, and death was something that was meant to take place at home in the 19th century, so that was very disconcerting. They, people did not have identity badges or dog tags. Um, there was no systematic, no one assigned, there was not a graves registration unit within military units, so no one was assigned to get the names of the dead, write to their next of kin. There were often not burial units, they were simply soldiers who, after a battle, when the victor, north or south, held the field, then all those dead bodies, something had to be done with them. And so soldiers would be detailed, sometimes prisoners of war, get rid of the dead. And so that did not usually include any kind of systematic counting or um, identifying or praying for or having funeral services for or marking graves. It all was an invention in the moment. People improvise, improvised in face in of the context of the Battle of Antietam, I think uh, 23,000 people were killed in one battle? <laughs> Not killed, no, no. Or, That's injured the and killed, injured. injured and killed. Mm -hmm. And in Gettysburg? Well, get, Gettysburg, it went close to 50,000. Injured and killed. Yeah. OK, so let's suppose in Gettysburg, you have about 7,000 who were killed, something like that, and 3,000 horses. So they're lying in Gettysburg. What did people do? Did they bury them right there, or they just left the, the troops there and they just went about their business? What, what happened? It depended whether the dead were Confederate or Union. In, at Gettysburg, the Union held the field, and so there was an effort on the part of units to find the dead of their unit and give them some kind of decent burial, which would mean usually wrapping them in a bag of burlap and digging a hole, in, an individual hole, if you could, for your own men. Men from the other side, you usually lined them up by pulling, bending your bayonet and pulling them along and getting them in a big line and then throwing, digging a big pit <clears throat> and throwing them all into a pit. So uh, when people were dying in these battles, um, did relatives ultimately come forward to try to find the bodies? And how did they know where the bodies were? And were there people that helped them find these bodies? Mm -hmm. Your question uh, makes me realize I should also amend what I just described, because if you were an officer, you would not be treated like that. There would be usually a uh, coffin for you. You might well be shipped home by Railway Express. There was a real class difference in how the dead of both sides were treated. And Union officers or Confederate officers might often show um, respect and treat the bodies of enemy officers with respect as well. But in, um, to go to the implication of your question, because people at home did not have faith that they would be notified in any systematic way, they flocked to battlefields to themselves try to find their missing loved ones and to provide the care that they feared would not otherwise be available. Now in those days, and people wanted to die a so-called good death, which meant that you uh, died in a bed where you could talk to your relatives. You could say, this is what I want to do in the afterlife, and this is what I did in the current life, and say goodbye. Uh, it was still very uh, important to them to make sure that their relatives had died, even in battlefield, a good death. Could you describe how people tried to pretend that everybody had a good death? It was meant to replicate the deathbed scene that is such a commonplace in so much Victorian literature because the moment of death was seen as defining of eternity. It was, took on 
tremendous importance and your last words indicated whether you were likely to um, go to heaven or to hell and whether your relatives were likely to be reunited with you in the afterlife. So to record an individual's last words, to describe someone's willingness to die and thus their acceptance of God's will, all of this was extremely significant. And so often individuals in hospitals, nurses, orderlies, doctors would listen and sometimes record these last words. Clara Barton, who was a uh, hospital nurse for the Union Army, had a sheaf of little papers that she kept in a, in a pocket in her apron. And in her papers, you can see these little scribbles of people's names and addresses and some words. And she must have kept them until she went off duty. And then she would write to the families and tell them what she had experienced as their loved ones died. You often hear about Walt Whitman um, and his attendance in military hospitals. A lot of what he did was to write to the families of the men he watched die and describe the nature of their deaths with the reassurance therein of their ultimate reunion with their loved ones in eternity. Now, it was thought it was very important to preserve the corpse if possible because it would be more dignified. And what happened to embalming and icing? Did that uh, get invented roughly then? Uh, embalming was just coming into to, um, more widespread use at the time of the Civil War, but it was expensive. And so that was something that was used more by officers and upper class individuals. When I said coffins were shipped home, some of these coffins were iced. They were very elaborate technological um, inventions to enable coffin, uh, bodies to be shipped home, or they had to be embalmed. And the railway companies began to, in the course of the war, get more and more stringent about how a body had to have been um, cared for because they had putrefying, this is really gross, I'm sorry, putrefying bodies on the railway. And so if they didn't say, you know, you have to have a level of embalming, that, that was very um, unappealing. Now, these men were fighting each other, often very close. They, many of the people were killed in close combat. It wasn't a thousand yards away. They were relatively close. Um, how did these young men feel about killing people and seeing people die? Did it destroy their ability to continue fighting, or did they just accept it as part of the necessary requirements? It was a struggle for a lot of these soldiers. And you find in their letters and diaries their descriptions of how they came to bear the idea of, of killing. And sometimes it would be to hatred, that it could be, it was easier when it was revenge if people on your side had been hurt. Um, sometimes it was religion that made them think of themselves as God's army or Christian soldiers, and that enabled them to kill. But you, you often find in, in wartime letters these kinds of expressions of anxiety, regret. Some soldiers didn't fire at all, fired up into the air rather than kill others. And uh, what about uh, civilians? A large number of civilians who were not in combat got killed. Uh, how did that happen? Well, we know compare even less about the civilians than we do about military deaths because at least there was some semblance of a death list and a counting of the troops so that you'd know how many were missing. With civilians, there's often no record, and so it's a much more anecdotal sense of what went on. Disease is one aspect of it. Troops that were carrying disease would spread them to civilians as well. Um, in the South in particular, there are descriptions of um, deprivation, starvation, uh, difficulties uh, that arose from the shortages that the war brought to bear. There was also guerrilla fighting in many parts of the border states in particular, Western North Carolina, Missouri, and a lot more historical work has been done recently on these guerrilla activities, indicating they were much more widespread than, than had been thought in the past. And talking about burials, if you were an African American, there were roughly 200,000 African Americans who fought for the North. Um, were you allowed to be buried in the same cemetery as a white person? Um, the national cemetery system that emerged from the Civil War separated black and white soldiers in burial. What about Confederate and Northern soldiers? Could they be buried in the same cemetery? The National Cemetery System did include no 
um, Southerners. It was only for Union soldiers. So after the war was over and the National Cemeteries were being set up, what happened to the Confederate bodies? These the bodies, nobody was paying attention to them and the South not getting there upset about that? There are photographs and there are descriptions of um, Union um, officials coming to find bodies to bury in Union cemeteries after the war, and there'll be a Confederate body lying there and a Union body lying there, and the Union one gets picked up and the Confederate one is just left there. Um, in response to this, there were organizations that emerged in the South, mostly uh, led by Southern, white Southern women, to compensate for the lack of Northern attention, Union attention. And this is after Appomattox, so the nation's supposedly at peace. But the Southern women organized burial societies and memorial societies, raised money, and scoured the countryside around Richmond, the countryside around various other places where there were uh, intense engagements during the war, and reburied the um, soldiers and brought them together with private means rather than the public means of national U.S. engagement. Now, after people died in the war, very often their relatives would still want to communicate with them and the uh, uh, rise of seances apparently occurred. In fact, um, I guess it was um, Mrs. Lincoln mm -hmm. had one for her son, Willie, who had mm -hmm. died uh, during the time of the Civil War. Uh, how popular were these seances, and did they actually communicate with people who had died? Or <laughs> Well, there are a lot of people who believed they did, and it seems to me a symptom of the nation's effort to grapple with this enormous loss and to try to understand where had these young men gone and were they lost forever. And one consoling thought was if you believed in a Christian afterlife, you believed that you would be reunited with this person. But if you could convince yourself to believe in spiritualism, then that also provided a measure of solace that you might be able to reunite with them even sooner than your death. There was a very popular best-selling book called The Gates Ajar. It was essentially about um, a woman who has lost a brother who she loved dearly and comes to communicate with him and believes he's just around the door and so that she can still reach him. He's gone, but not gone. Okay, and after the war was completely over, um, then there was an effort to account for everybody that was killed and they really try to figure out who actually died so they know who died and where they were buried. Is that right? And that generally work? That was a union effort that was um, established through a series of acts of Congress and the uh, establishment of the National Cemetery System in 1866. And between 1866 and the early 1870s, there was an initiative where soldiers were sent, soldiers who had finished fighting but were now still in off I mean, still in uniform, were sent into the South to try to find all the Union bodies that had been buried in odd churchyards or abandoned on the side of roads. And part of the motivation for this was that reports were rising of um, desecration of Union soldiers' graves and Union bodies by angry um, ex-Confederates. And so the notion was partly to honor the Northern dead and partly simply to protect them. And that led to the reburial in national cemeteries of over 300,000 dead Union soldiers in those years. The two most famous cemeteries in the North, I guess, were Gettysburg, and it was President Lincoln who went there and made mm -hmm. his famous Gettysburg Address. It. What was unique about the Gettysburg uh, Cemetery, the way it was set up in terms of making everybody equal? That it did not separate officers and men. It was um, organized so that everybody who had sacrificed for the nation was treated the same. And Arlington Cemetery, that was the front lawn of Robert E. Lee. Why was that used as a cemetery? Well, the Quartermaster General of the United States was a man named Montgomery Meggs, and his uh, son was killed in a way that he thought was really unjust. He had surrendered, essentially. He had, um, was just shot after having done so. And so Montgomery Meggs w was seen to have been quite vindictive and angry about the South. So planting the cemetery in the front of um, Robert E. Lee's house seemed to him and seemed to many uh, a message about the uh, resentment of, well, of that Robert E. Lee would never be able to go back and live and there. Never with. leave it there again. So let's switch to the modern times a bit and talk about Harvard. So um, Harvard was started in 1636, 
and it ran out of money around 1637 or 1638, <laughs> closed down for a few years. But it's been around for a while, and it was the first college in the United States. Um, it managed to have 27 presidents who were male before you got the job. You were the first female as a 28th president. Do you think Harvard would be in better shape today if some of the other 27 were female? <laughs> no doubt about it. Okay. <laughs> Just don't, don't ask me to pick which ones. Okay. So um, let's talk about the job of being Har uh, Harvard's president, how you got this job. You were um, a professor at University of Pennsylvania, and you were recruited to run something called the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. What was that? Radcliffe College uh, had existed as a separate legal entity from the time of its founding at the end of the 19th century uh, until the end of the 20th century. In 1999, there was finally an agreement to merge Radcliffe and Harvard, even though through various um, treaties and agreements over the years, undergraduate life had essentially been merged, women and men. But women at Harvard still got diplomas that also said Radcliffe. They got a letter of admission that came from Harvard and Radcliffe. And this just seemed to many, this was, I was still at Penn when this was all arranged, seemed to many to have uh, become untenable and there just needed to be a merger. So the two merged, but the agreement was not to have Radcliffe College retain authority over undergraduate women. They were to be completely integrated into Harvard College. But Radcliffe would become an institute for advanced study with a wide-ranging uh, mandate to, f to include all fields of study, but to have a special attention to women, gender, and society in, in light of its long history. All right, so you were brought to Harvard to run that institute, and you ran it for about six or seven years. Mm -hmm. And then Harvard was looking for a new president. Larry Summers had stepped down. Uh, did you think you would get the position, or did you say no one who's a woman's going to get this job? Or I had no idea that I would get the job. I was I knew that I was being considered for it, but it seemed to me after 370, however many years that right. they hadn't chosen a woman, I wasn't. I didn't have high expectations that okay. that would happen. Okay, so when you you're given the job in, in 2007. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, Harvard was widely considered, and still is, the most famous university in the world, I think, and maybe the most elite university in many uh, respects. Many people may disagree, went to other schools. But why did Harvard become so famous? What was it? Was it uh, uh, 300 years ago, 200 years ago, 150 years ago that Harvard sort of transcended almost every other university in terms of its elite status? What was it, and when did it occur? It's such an interesting question, and you could answer it in a variety of ways, I think. Its longevity gave it a certain staying power and a certain prominence, but it really was a kind of New England institution. Well into um, the 19th century, Charles William Eliot, who became president in 1869 and served for 40 years till 1909, turned it into a research university modeled on the European model of research universities. It wasn't the first. Johns Hopkins, which you're, you've been closely associated with, really led the way. But Charles William Eliot was a brilliant president and expanded the domain of what Harvard did and raised the level of its excellence in a manner that I think had a lasting effect. A second president who I would mention comes much later, um, who I think also felt had a big impact in broadening the, imp the uh, reach of Harvard beyond New England, was James Bryan Conant, who quite explicitly established a system of recruiting scholarship students and a financial aid system that was meant to reach to talented people all over the United States. And he was very, very well aware of the dangers of becoming too provincial, too elite. And so he quite self-consciously worked to combat that. And I think that also positioned Harvard very well at a, a very important moment because Conant served from the early 30s to the early 50s. And so he was able to put his imprimatur on Harvard during the years right after the war with the GI Bill and really opened Harvard up then and tried to have talent and merit rather than privilege and wealth be the foundation of the So let me students. ask you the most important question about Harvard. Uh, how do you get into Harvard? Um, <laughs> I assume people come up to you all the time and they slip your, the resumes of their children or their grandchildren 
or people are calling you all the time and saying, well, by the way, my little boy Johnny is really great and he deserves to get in. Uh, how does one get into Harvard? Well, you have to fill out an application. Okay. okay. <laughs> and after that? When students ask me what they sh and I get letters like this, as you say, all the time. I, I have a f kind of formula that I write to them about read a lot and think widely and study a lot of different things and do things you're, you, you are excited about. But to me, I think the characteristic that is probably the most salient one is, is this individual interesting? We want to make sure the person can do the academic work, and so things like SATs and GPA are evidence of that. But there's so many students who apply who are almost identical in being excellent in those qualities. So is this person interesting? And is this person going to be one who educates her or his peers as well as having an education delivered unto them? Will they take advantage of what Harvard is? Well, how many applications do you get for undergraduate admission every year? It's gotten up to about 40,000. 40,000, and you accept about how many of those? Well, the freshman class has 1,660 students. So, and we have about a, last year we had, I think, an 83% 83% yield, which is the highest in the country, which means 83% of the people who get admission do come. And you're, you accept roughly 5% or so. Mm -hmm. So you could fill your entire class on valedictorians or perfect SAT people. So how do you decide you need some athletes, you need some uh, cellists, you need some um, physicists? How do you, who decides all that? Well, we have an admissions committee that works, reads every application, sorts through them, discusses them. Um, the applications are sent in from all over the world. Most of the individuals have had a chance to be interviewed by an alum somewhere in the world. So we have uh, testimony about okay. that. But what about, sometimes there are books that say how to write great essays for Harvard applications. And how can you be sure that people writing these application essays are actually writing them? It's a great question. And the answer is? The answer is I, we have these very experienced people in admissions who I think feel that they can get the flavor of an artificial okay. um, essay that has been produced by um, a professional. Now, in the new class at Harvard, uh, undergraduate class, I think for the first time you have a majority of non-whites. Is that right or mostly close the to that? The class that was admitted was majority-minority. The class that actually matriculated was not. Okay. So you, but now you have roughly, your undergraduates are what percentage, let's say, minority, what percentage? Very close to 50. 50-50. What percentage are first generation, which means their parents didn't go to college? It's about 16%. And what percentage of people are getting financial aid? 60, close to 60, between 50 and 60% each year. So let's suppose you are, you're, my father worked in the post office. He didn't make that much money. Had I applied to Harvard, which I didn't do because I didn't, sure I wouldn't have gotten in, but had I applied, um, and Just I- Just think how your life might have been I, different. It'd been different, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, if I had applied and gotten in, I don't, how could I have afforded then? I probably couldn't then. But today, if, you're make under, if your parents make under X dollars, you, mm -hmm. in effect, get scholarships? So we introduced a new financial aid program um, over beginning before I became president and then expanded during my presidency. And for families who make less than $65,000 a year, there's no parental contribution. So if your father made less than $65,000 a year, which I'm sure he did in those days, but whatever that would have been turned into now, right. you would have come with no family contribution. That group of students makes up about 20% of our entering class now, and that's a real demographic change in the nature of the undergraduate student body. Now, you have, to f you have more athletic teams, I think, than virtually any other college, though you, know, you don't get, give athletic scholarships. But um, is it easy to get in, easier to get into Harvard if you're an athlete because you have to fill up those athletic teams? Well, it's hard to be an athlete, too. So I don't, I don't know how to figure that out. Well, quite. let's suppose you're a good basketball player and you're a good scholar, um, but your coach has to fill the basketball team. So does he get some preference in saying, let's get this person in? Well, we look for students who have a variety of skills and expertise, as you said. We have students who are extraordinary cellists. Yo-Yo Ma came to Harvard. Even as Yo-Yo Ma, he'd already become quite a, a presence as a cellist. We have students who are really outstanding in a variety of realms. And so all of that is part of the, 
holistic profile that we, we focus on. Let's talk about faculty. It's often difficult to please faculty. You would probably agree, or maybe it's easy, I don't know. <laughs> but um, there's a system in our country called tenure, which means that you are approved as a faculty member, and once you have tenure, you have it for more or less life. Um, is that a good system, or is that going to ever change, or do you think it's, it works out OK? There's some really positive dimensions of tenure and some, I think, necessary ones. The foundational argument for tenure is that it ensures that faculty have freedom of speech and that they can express their views and that I can't fire them if I'm mad because they said something that was critical of me or that was a truth that might undermine our fundraising or whatever kind of intervention in their ability to speak their minds. And so that is the foundation for tenure. I think it also gives faculty the ability to really be ambitious about their intellectual work and to think long term about it because they don't have to be accountable every year for a new discovery. They can take on a big project that may not come to fruition for a considerable period of time. And they can think beyond the immediacy of, okay. of a, a a clock. Let's talk about student life. Um, ever since uh, students have been going to college in the United States uh, for hundreds of years, uh, drinking has been a problem, it seems, uh, in, back in the colonial days and even now. Is drinking, a gi uh, drinking alcohol a, a gigantic problem at Harvard or other colleges you're familiar with? I might just say a word about your, your notion of it being a problem in the colonial period. Outside my office, there's an excavation done by an uh, anthropology class of Harvard yard, and as they dig down, what they mostly find is bottles. <laughs> so I think that's some pretty firm evidence okay. of, of what you've described. Um, it's today? <laughs> today, yes. It is a real challenge. And every university president confronts life-threatening issues well, related you, to drinking. You and I were in college. The drinking age in the United States, I think, was largely 18. And therefore, you could drink largely when you're in college. Uh, now it's 21, so therefore students who want to drink who are under 21 have to do so off campus or surreptitiously. And what do you do about that? How do you prevent that from happening? It's, well, we have a whole office of alcohol awareness and response for students. We try to, the biggest threat is from first year students who arrive and take advantage of their freedom to drink illegally and often excessively. We worry a lot about whether they're going to end up in the hospital or perhaps, you know, dead. There have certainly been instances of that at campuses around the United States. One of the things that I do think has changed besides the drinking age is the way in which people drink. Binge drinking, drinking before you go to a party to get really drunk, um, drinking many, many uh, drinks at a time. This is something that is more characteristic of this student generation than of generations that preceded it. And I believe it is linked with a level of stress that these students feel. Every university president now is concerned and talking to one another about mental health issues, the demand for mental health services, the kinds of anxiety students are feeling, and I think the drinking issues are part of that larger profile. It raises real questions about what is it like to be 18 to 21 years old in the United States right now. The stress is due to the pressure to get jobs or get good grades? It's to do with jobs and good grades and what's their future going to bring. I also think it's been exacerbated by social media. I had a very interesting conversation in my office a few weeks ago with three long-serving women's athletic coaches who had coached teams at Harvard, women's teams for each, each of these women more than 20 years, one almost 40 years. And they were talking to me about how different young women of this particular era are from even a decade ago. And what they said was these young women are always comparing themselves to these images of perfection that have been posted on Facebook or Instagram or Snap, and not recognizing that those have often been fashioned and curated to show a perfection that isn't real. But they, they feel that they, too, need to live up to that. And so the sense of always being scrutinized, always having to be on display, always having to compete, I think that also has intensified the anxieties. Now, you mentioned Facebook. Um, Facebook was started by a Harvard dropout, and Microsoft was started by a 
Harvard dropout. Do you think there's an advantage to dropping out of Harvard? <laughs> and uh, maybe you can do pretty well without a Harvard degree, or you think a Harvard degree really is necessary this day? Well, my husband has a great response to that. He says, well, they had Harvard to drop out of. Yeah. All right, so <laughs> now there he is. Now, what about um, drugs? Drugs, are they more popular now and a bigger problem than, than alcohol? They are uh, less of a problem than alcohol. Oh, really? We really don't face the kinds of right. challenges with drugs. What about sexual harassment and assault? Is that a big problem now? Yes, it is a big problem. And as many of you may know, we, along with uh, about 26 other universities, did a survey uh, four years ago now about the prevalence of sexual assault on our campus. And we were horrified by what we found, by the number of young women who had been reported having been sexually assaulted during their time on campus. So we have overhauled all our procedures for preventing that, for dealing with that, for educating people about it. And we are also now very much uh, uh, part of the whole national issue of sexual harassment, the Me Too movement, people coming forward and talking about um, experiences of sexual harassment on campus as well. So both of these issues are very significant. And do you believe the reporting of it is much better than it was before, but that it's actually the conduct is different than before or just the reporting of it is different than before? I won't really, we won't really know that until we do another survey. We didn't want to do a survey right away because we wanted to have a little time to see if the different procedures and education and processes we put in place were having an effect. But people are reporting it more. And I am glad about that because what, whether you want to uh, make a claim against someone or, or um, follow up on an on a incident, I want that, that an individual has to decide. But anybody who has experienced that should ask for help. And if people are coming forward, it means they're asking for help. Let's talk about the endowment. Um, when you became president of Harvard, shortly thereafter, there was a financial crisis. The endowment from Harvard, of Harvard, which is the biggest in the country, went down a fair bit. Did that really constrain your ability to operate the, uh, the university? And you've been criticized, uh, not you, but Harvard, for having such a big endowment. People say, well, why do they need that big an endow of an endowment? In fact, Congress, in the, the new tax law, has said, let's tax this endowment and other large endowments. So first, uh, what does the endowment really do? Uh, how difficult was it to manage that endowment and Harvard during the financial crisis? And what about the tax? What is your view on that? Uh, our endowment funds about 36% of our operating budget. So we are deeply dependent on our endowment. When the financial crisis happened, the endowment dropped by 27%. That was an enormous blow to our ability to fund our basic operations. And we made very significant cuts, starting right away, stretching out over a two-year period to try to get our expenses in line with what the endowment was yielding. Um, to us. It meant asking a lot of questions about what we did, and it uh, led us, I think, to scrutinize just about every aspect of how Harvard was organized. And we ended up overhauling the library, changing all our budgeting processes, introducing much more long-term planning, changing our governance structure. So it had a very big effect. And it had, I think, many good outcomes in that we are far better organized for a financial future than we were at that time. The question of, is our endowment too big? Well, if you think about what we do, we are a conglomerate of so many activities. We have one of the largest art museums in the United States that's funded by the endowment. We have a uh, research center on Renaissance Italy that's located in Florence that's funded by the endowment. We have Dumbarton Oaks, a research center on Byzantine um, activities that's located in Washington, D.C. We fund the Arnold Arboretum, which is an arboretum, but it's also a large open public park in Boston. Many times when people say the endowment's too big, they're thinking it's funding a college of 6,600 students. Well, it's doing that, but it's also funding 12 schools, financial aid, and all these other activities in which we're involved. Your endowment is the biggest in the country, but not per capita, or no. per student, is that right? No, it is not the biggest per student. And what about the tax? Uh, Congress proposed a tax in the, in the new tax law. Uh, what's the theory behind that tax, if you can figure that out? <laughs> well, what it, I, 
it does not have a theory that makes any sense to me. And I've spent a lot of time over the past year working with people in Washington to try to keep this tax from happening. I was told by the Republican leadership um, in uh, January of 2017, and I visited most of them individually, and they all said to me, we will never introduce an endowment tax. It's a terrible idea, it makes no sense, it's against Republican principles. So I sort of breathed a sigh of relief, but then back came the idea of an endowment tax out of the House Ways and Means Committee, uh, proposed as somehow the logic that was expressed was this would somehow make us put more money into financial aid. I never figured out how taxing us would make us put more money in financial aid. So I returned to Washington numbers of times trying to persuade individuals uh, in Congress to give this idea up. Many of them agreed with me it wasn't a great idea, but there were other priorities related to the tax bill, which as you know, moved through very quickly. And there were some efforts on the part of some members, both of the House and Senate, on the Republican side. Democrats were supportive all, all the way, but some Republicans tried to get that out of the tax bill, but the priorities for the Republican Party did not focus on whether or not there was an endowment tax. There were other kind of th things they were trying to get done. So what we have is a tax that um, imposes a 1.4% levy on investment income of endowments of institutions, private institutions only, though some publics have quite large endowments. They aren't taxed, Texas, for example. Um, <laughs> private institutions that have more than $500,000 per student in endowment wealth. For us, this will mean, if it were levied on this year's finances, it would mean about $43 million. We think Congress will change this at any point in the near future? Or? Well, we keep hoping, hoping there was some conversation about maybe something would happen with the omnibus bill that's under consideration right now. I, I think once again, it has kind of fallen to the side as something not important in, in people's minds in Congress as other things they're focused on. Well, dealing with the financial crisis was a challenge and dealing with the tax is a challenge, but I think some people say the biggest challenge you've had was that you were invited 2012 to throw out a first pitch at the Boston Red Sox game. Uh, is that terrifying to throw out that in front of all those people? And did you have a lot of experience to do that? No, I did not have experience doing this. And it was terrifying because I thought the whole identity of womanhood was <laughs> on the line and that it was imperative that I do this well. So I was invited to do it in September. Thank goodness it was the end of the season. So I had the whole summer to practice. <laughs> And so after dinner every night, my husband and I would go out and play catch. <laughs> and I got the Harvard baseball coach to come and give me some tips. And a member of the corporation who had been uh, the captain of the baseball team, Joe O'Donnell, came and gave me some tips. And my daughter, who was really a softball ace, gave me some tips. And so I thought, at least I've tried. Whatever happens, at least I've tried. So what happened? So I actually don't remember a lot of it. I was so <laughs> terrified. But this is something I learned from being a historian of war. What was in my mind was drill. What military drill does is enables you to act without using your brain, right? You just put it into your muscle memory. So I wanted to be ready to throw this pitch without using my brain. And what I remember is I remember standing on the sidelines and someone said, it's time to go out there. And the next thing I remember was Mike Lowell, who I got to choose which member of the Red Sox I wanted to catch my pitch. And I chose Mike Lowell, who was then the third baseman. I remember him coming towards me with this enormous smile in his face and the ball in his hand. And I did it. <laughs> so the Harvard, the Harvard Crimson, the undergraduate newspaper, which is pretty critical of Harvard presidents. My best headline, my best article from the Harvard Crimson was the day after that pitch. I got great big letters, great throw, Drew. So what's the greatest pleasure, other than throwing out that baseball, of being the president of Harvard? What I love most is being able to watch people do the things they do with such excellence. And it might be a faculty member reporting on a discovery it might be students 
putting on a theatrical performance. It might be students talking about work they've done in a class. But to feel that my role is to nurture an institution that can enable them. I love feeling that I can be part of and witness and support what they are about. One of the challenges of being president of a university is you have to do a lot of fundraising, and particularly during a great American invention called the Capital Campaign. <laughs> so during your tenure, you launched a capital campaign, I think which is the first in Harvard in maybe 20 years or so, and it will be the largest capital campaign, and is uh, so far, that's ever been successfully launched by a university. How much of your time did you have to spend begging for money around the world? It's hard to exactly analyze how my calendar works because a lot of things I do have multiple functions. For example, if I go to a football game with some alumni, I'm involved with students, I'm involved with alumni, is that a fundraising effort? So it's a little murky. But I spent probably 25 to 30 percent of my time on fundraising. Now, one person who gave the largest gift in Harvard's history so far, uh, John Paulson, a uh, person in the financial community in New York, he gave a $400 million gift. Um, did you just call him and say, give me $400 million? Is that just <laughs> that one phone call, or did you have to have lunch as well? Or is that, <laughs> is that, that happen overnight, or how does that happen? Well, John Paulson is a graduate of the business school. So he um, was well known in the business school and was uh, kind of cultivated and um, approached by the dean of the business school about what he might want to do uh, in okay. terms of philanthropy to Harvard. And John began talking about his interests. And it was clear he, he would be interested in doing something that went beyond the business school. So I met with him. I went to some, he came to meetings at which I spoke. Um, over a period of maybe three, four years, we interacted and talked about the growing presence of engineering, the importance of engineering. And his gift was to endow the engineer, the newly created 2007 engineering school. So it took place over a lengthy period of time. As I got to know him, he um, had further conversations with the dean of the business school. All of us met together. All of us um, developed so this plan. The second largest gift in Harvard's history also occurred during this capital campaign. You got a $350 million gift from a uh, Chinese American family, the Chan family. They renamed the uh, School of Public Health. Did that happen overnight as well? <laughs> <laughs> it was somewhat similar in that um, Gerald Chan is a graduate of our School of Public Health. He was very involved in the School of Public Health and got to be quite close to the then Dean Julio Frank, who is a kind of hero of public health worldwide. He'd been Minister of Health in Mexico. And I think Gerald came to see that this school could do so much good in the world and was under-resourced, and that to have a foundation of the kind of endowment that he could provide would be game-changing. And he thought a lot about his mother, who was a nurse, and um, really thought about doing this in honor of, of his father and his mother and his own commitment to public health. Okay. Now, uh, you uh, became the president in 2007, and you announced recently, about a few months ago or so, that you would be stepping down at Harvard. Your successor has now been uh, named uh, Larry Bacow, former president of Tufts University and a member of the Harvard Corporation Board. Why did you decide to step down? You've had a very successful time. You've raised this large capital campaign. Everybody seems to like you at Harvard. I haven't found anybody that doesn't like you. So why not just coast for a few more years on this great <laughs> reputation? It seems to me that leadership roles, presidencies, have a certain rhythm about them. And you build a team, and you achieve certain goals with a team. And then the team begins to think, maybe it's time for them to do something else. And you're not as fresh. Your eyes aren't as fresh. You're not seeing things as clearly. And it just comes time to hand it over to somebody who is going full speed with a whole long-term set of new goals. Our capital campaign ends at the end of June. And so it seemed to me that that was a good marker, uh, a time that was appropriate for me to say, I will end at the end of June also. And the next long-term vision can come from my successor. All right, what will you do next? Well, I would like to try to learn to be a historian again. And I say that quite self-consciously, because so much has changed. 
about how one does research over the last 11 years with all the kinds of search opportunities and engines, so I need to be tutored in how to use uh, a library and how to do research. I also am very far behind in my field. I haven't been reading the 150 books a year that get published on Civil War history. I've been otherwise engaged, so I have to catch up. Well, um, you've raised about $8 billion in the capital campaign. In my business, private equity, if you'd raise that much money, you'd be very highly compensated, and you're obviously a very good fundraiser. Would you consider private equity as a possible? <laughs> Make me an offer, David. All right, we'll talk about it. <laughs> Drew, I want to thank you for doing a great job at leading Harvard. Thank you, and very much. Thank you. Thank you.